I'd like to take a few minutes to answer the question, am I too evil for God to save? Um, if you're clicking on this video, there's a good chance that you are wondering about that question. Um, I don't know who you are. God does, though. And um, I don't know what you've done, what you've been involved in, and whatever else. The question is, have you gotten to the point where God can't save you? Well, I'm going to give you a very simple two-part test. Okay? Here's how it works. First test is I want you to hold your hand. I want you to put it over your mouth and breathe. Out. Exhale. Do you feel breath on your hand? Okay. You're still living. God can save you. All right. Test number two. Another one that's very important. Put your fingers there on your artery going in you know, on your wrist there. Do you feel a heartbeat? How about put your hand here on your above your heart? Do you feel a heartbeat? Put your fingers up in here. Do you feel a heartbeat? Okay. You're still alive. God can save you. Let me give you some scriptures to think about. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 15 verse 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. God has seen everything that you've ever done in your life. And if you are still breathing and you still have a pulse, then you can still get saved. Job chapter 42 verses 1 and 2 says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Romans 2.16 says, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. God knows every thought you've ever thought. Not only has he seen what you've done, he knows every thought that you've ever had. There it says that, and then also your secrets. You could be part of a secret society and have done some really wicked things or witchcraft or perversion. Nobody knows about certain things that you've done except for you and God. And if you're still alive, that means God hasn't killed you. That should be fairly obvious, right? Of course. So if you're still alive, does that mean that God is still willing to save you? You say, what about an unpardonable sin? The unpardonable sin is not possible unless Jesus Christ is physically on the earth in the first century and in the millennial kingdom. Those are the only two times that he's physically on the earth walking around among men. So you can't commit an unpardonable sin right now. You say, well, I had to sell my soul to the devil to be part of what I'm... The devil already owned your soul, okay? Um, when you're lost, he already owns your soul. You're already going to hell. Uh, you can't sell it to the devil when he already owns it. The point is here, God knows everything about you, and yet he hasn't killed you. So if you're so evil that God says, okay, I can't save you anymore, then God will kill you at that point in time. You say, well, the devil, what about the devil? The devil wants you dead even more than God does. See, God is actually protecting you. He's preserving your life to give you a chance to get saved. I'll tell you what the qualifications are here as we continue. Psalm 139, verses 1 through 14. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, and I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If, my, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day, the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. It's actually written from a positive angle. It's not saying, I can't hide from God. He's just saying, even if I tried to, you're still watching over me. You see, there are some things that might have happened in your life that are so dark and so horrible that you really don't want anybody to know about it. But God knows about it. And God still is preserving your life. Why? To give you a chance to get saved. 
It's a beautiful thing. But notice there it said about, uh, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God made you. He's your creator. And you should look at that and say, this is a wonderful thing. It's fearfully because... Wow, to imagine a being that could create everybody out there and know all about them and watch them. That's the kind of being that you should fear. You shouldn't fear the uh, people part, that are part of your fraternal organizations or your coven or, or whatever else you, that you're part of. Don't fear them. Fear God. He's the only one that's worthy of it. But you say, okay, I get it, but why would God want somebody who's as wicked and evil as me? Um, and you don't need to tell me, you don't need to confess your sins to any other man out there. All you have to do is understand that God knows everything that you've ever done. You say, okay, well, if he knows everything I've ever done, he's seen the evil, he's seen the perverted things and the, and the horrible stuff that I've had to do. And I've been part of the abuse that I suffered as a child or whatever. You know what it is. Why would God want somebody like me? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. The greatest Christian that ever lived said that he was the chiefest of sinners. God's not looking for righteous people. We'll see that here in a few minutes. He's not looking for the good people. He's looking for sinners. And if you'll understand that and say, Yeah, boy, my life is a mess. I don't like the way things are going and it's sure not looking good for me in the future. I want out of this system. You're exactly what God's looking for. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. See, the beautiful thing about this is, it isn't some kind of a thing of, okay, I want to be saved, God will save me, and now I have to jump through all these hoops and I have to make pilgrimages to to certain holy cities and you have to come here and kiss my ring or something or my foot or whatever. No, that isn't it. That's not it at all. God wants to save you and he's going to give you his life. It's called imputation. His righteousness, his perfect life that he lived when he was here on the earth. He gives it to you and he takes your sin and pays the price for it. He already paid it. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin, sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Old song about that, an old hymn. That's the whole point here. God is looking for sinners, people that are honest enough to admit that they've messed up. Church buildings and organized religion are people that are not honest. They're going there, primarily the vast majority of them, they go there to, to get around other good people and have good standards, most of which don't even appear in the Bible, and then it makes them feel good about each other and good about us and, hey, we're all good and we're all good people and everything else. They're do-gooders. That's why you don't feel like you fit in around them. You see, you get around some truly saved people that have testimonies. You can say, boy, the stuff I used to be involved in, I was such a sinner, the chief of sinners. That's the right group. Mark chapter 2, verse 17. When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You want a way out of your life? out of the secret societies that you're in, or out of the perversion that you're involved in, or whatever else, the occult, all the dark stuff, and the fear that you live under, do you want a way out of it? Then God's calling you. He's calling you as a sinner to repentance. Repentance means not only are you changing your mind about things and whatever, but it's also a change of direction. It's a change of life. Right? Um, you're a drug addict. And you come to me and you say, I'm, I'm so sick and I'm, I'm terrible. And I say, okay, I can put you on, a, on natural health and get you back to really good health. And I can tell you the right kind of exercises to do and the right herbal teas to drink and this and that. And you'll feel so much better. Well, I, yeah, that it sounds good, but I don't really know if I want to give up the pain and the sickness that I live in continually. That would be crazy. Well, why would somebody come to the Lord and say, 
I want to accept your death, burial, and resurrection as payment for my sins, but then I'm just going to continue in that life. I don't need any help getting out of this life that I have. No. God calls sinners to repentance. He's looking for sinners. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. God's not looking for the church building people. Don't think that you have to clean up your life and really get good and right and everything else in this wonderful church going, baptized, whatever. That's not what God's looking for. He wants you as you are, as a sinner. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, if you were really sick and you came to me and you said, could you please heal me? Could you please help me to get better? It's going to mean a lifestyle change, but it's not nearly as bad as what you're currently living under. That's what the Lord is trying to say there. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. I'll purchase you. I'll buy you. You'll become part of my family. And then I'll tell you what to do. And it will be good things. It will help you get away from the wicked lifestyle that you currently have. It will bring new people into your life and new experiences into your life. And you'll have joy. You'll find rest unto your soul. Wouldn't it be nice to have rest? You can have it through Jesus Christ. Not through church. Okay? Understand that. Church in the New Testament means people. People that gather together. I'm part of the church right now. I'm in church right now. Right? It's not some kind of a building with a steeple on top, which is a satanic obelisk. Um, if you study the whole thing, a Greek pagan temple, and they started to make them into church buildings. Look at a Greek Parthenon compared to the average church. I've done whole studies on that if you want to watch that and understand the history of what church buildings came from. They're pagan. They're completely pagan. And the people that go to them are lost. Uh, that's not what I'm telling you to get into. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You can have a reset. Your whole life can become new. Get a new start. Put your faith in Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross. Believe what the Bible says about him. Let me show you that. 1 John chapter 1, and then we'll get to chapter 5, where it talks about the written word of God. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanseth us from all sin, not some sins, not a few here and there, all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Organized religious people don't like to talk about their sins. They try to cover it up with their good deeds and uh, giving to charity and whatever else that they try to do. Um, saved sinners, we don't mind. You don't need to know everything that I've ever done. The Lord knows. Um, but I'll be honest about my testimony. I'll be honest about my past because there's been a change in my life now. I no longer do those things that I once did, that I was once ensnared by. But let's see about the written record here. 1 John chapter 5, verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. You can have a written record right here. The greatest book that has ever been written. No question about it. Anybody who's honest will admit that this King James Version, authorized version originally called, and it was nicknamed the King James Version or King James Bible. This is the greatest book that's ever showed up on this earth. Period. This is the written record. You get saved. You believe what's written about Jesus Christ in here. Then you're going to go to heaven when you die. And you can have assurance of that. 
and you don't have to continue to work for your salvation and oh you might lose it or something like that that is not true um, once you get saved you will be sealed with the holy spirit of promise until the day of redemption you won't even have to worry about it anymore that's the rest that comes upon your soul and having peace god will change your life that will happen and that's the reason we can say i no longer am messing around with the sins of my past still struggle with sin you always will but boy a lot has changed for me um, so hopefully that's been something that can encourage you I know I've heard from a lot of people that have gotten saved from some very dark situations um, people in sodomy people in the occult uh, Freemasonic organizations people in witchcraft um, get down through the list people that were child uh, abused as children molested as children um, some horrible things and um, you can tell me I've had people tell me some of the details and things but you really don't need to um, it's between you and God he's seen everything he knows everything he understands your thoughts and uh, if you're still alive then you have a chance to get saved so how do I get saved you say okay very simple first and foremost understand why if I tell you to call 911 you say look around and you say well I don't see anything on fire I'm not in any kind of a health issue what's going on well you have to understand if I come to you and I say hey the back of your house is on fire call 911 now it makes sense there is imminent danger there and you need to call for help well the imminent danger for you is if you die as a sinner you go to a place called hell and then eventually to a place called the lake of fire for for all of eternity that's what the Bible teaches um, God created hell for the very evil, very wicked people out there and those in organized religion that are into their own self-righteousness. That's why God created hell. You don't have to go there. Nobody's required to go to hell. Um, even Satan originally was part of God's creation and he fell by his own free choice. God didn't force him to fall. He didn't force him to rebel. So the Bible says that God prepared hell for the devil and his angels. And anybody that wants to go along with the devil they go there too so there's a fire and how do you get away from that fire well you have to call upon him who can save you from that fire and that is the Lord Jesus Christ and what you have to understand is he died on the cross to pay for your sins he came to the earth and he lived a perfect sinless life the only man that's ever been able to do that because he's God manifest in the flesh and again, if you don't understand who God is, let me explain very quickly. There are three parts to God. There's the body, there's the soul, and there's the spirit. The body is Jesus Christ, the soul is God the Father, and the spirit is the Holy Ghost. It's very simple. A lot of people try to complicate it with all this Trinitarian junk and whatever. That stuff is a lie. It's philosophical um, additions to the scriptures. And it's not necessary, and it messes up what the Bible actually teaches. So, Jesus Christ comes to the earth and he dies on the cross, lives a perfect life, and he dies on the cross to pay for your sins and my sins. And that payment is there. Now, all you have to do is you have to say, I believe that that can cover my sins. I'm not good enough. I'm a sinner. And I know he didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I can get in. I qualify to be a sinner. Can you say amen to that? Um, can you say that that's the truth? Do you qualify? Are you really an evil, wicked person? You say, well, I've done some really bad things. I have a sermon about Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer, the man that was a sodomite and he was a cannibal, killed his victims and then he would eat them and whatever else. Do horrible stuff that you can't even fathom. Uh, maybe there's somebody out there that's watching me right now that's been as bad and as evil as Jeffrey Dahmer, but I doubt it. Most of you haven't gone to that level yet. But the point is, Jeff Dahmer, when he got into prison, he realized all the bad things that he had done. He realized that, that the Bible was true and evolution was not, and he got saved. And I firmly believe that the man got saved. And going through the, his testimony and going through the man that was the preacher that was going in and talking to him, I believe he got saved. I genuinely do. Now, if God could save Jeff Dahmer, don't you think he could save you? I mean, he knows everything that you've ever done, even your, your secrets and your thoughts. And yet you're still living, you're still breathing, you still have a pulse, your heart's still beating. Yes, he can save you. 
But the one condition is you want to have a new life. You don't want to continue. See, if you want to continue in your evil and your wickedness, then I'll give you a real good suggestion. Start telling yourself that you're a good person or that you want to do good works to make yourself feel better. Maybe do a little bit of, uh, you know, um, public relations type of thing or whatever else. And I suggest you go and join a good church because that's where a lot of really evil hypocrites go. And you can go there and you can put on your nice church face and your nice little church outfit and whatever else and do good things in the community. And then you can be totally evil outside of church. That's the whole point of organized religion. You don't believe me? Well, just check into the Catholic Church. Uh, priests that rape and molest little children, and yet they're up there on a Sunday morning talking about Jesus and consecrating the host and all this other stuff. Wicked, wicked people go to church buildings. Stay away from them. All right? You come to the Lord and you say, I want to have a personal relationship with you. You know everything about me. You're the only one that knows it all. And I don't want to tell other people everything I've ever done. And if you'll take me, then I'll do whatever you say from then on. I want a new life. I don't want to live this life anymore. I want things to change. And then you call upon the name of the Lord. And you talk to Him in the best way that you know how. Your own words. There's no speci special little prayer or anything else. You just start praying to God. And you get this... King James Bible and you read it and you read what it talks about Romans chapter 10 verses 9 through 13 real good place to go for salvation um, a lot of wicked people out there say it isn't they say it'll actually lead you to hell it's because that's where they're going and they want you to come in with them that's the whole thing don't ever fall for that please if you ever see somebody and they're, they're saying that Romans chapter 10 verses 9 through 13 is not for you they're a Satanist they're a worshiper of the devil that's somebody that's very wicked and you need to stay away from them Okay, um, saying that there's a part of the Bible that can send you to hell if you do what it says, um, that's a problem. That's a big problem, especially when it's telling you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And you're not supposed to do that. You know, um, that's a problem. So call upon the name of the Lord, ask Him to save you, and... Um, and don't expect, oh, well, then you're just going to be super Christian the next day or something. Oh, it's going to take years of sanctification, but the Lord will start to lead you away from that old life that you used to have. And He'll start to clean up your mind, and He'll clean up your speech, and He'll clean up all kinds of things. Um, I've seen it. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in the lives of thousands of other people. It works. It definitely works. But you have to get in contact with God. You can't make salvation about your own intellect your own decision, my own mental belief or whatever. No, no. It has to be you getting in contact with God and you do that through calling upon Him. And without calling upon the name of the Lord, you're as good as being in hell with the door shut. So that is going to be it. Um, I will link a few videos at the end here, the Jeff Dahmer study and, and a few others. Um, please watch to get more information about uh, what it means to truly be saved. Uh, that is going to be it. Thank you for watching.